Perfect. All right. Um, once again, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome on in. We're so excited that you have all chosen to spend your Thursday evening with us. Um, if you do not already know me, my name is Clarice Wheeler. I am the Southern Nevada Programs Coordinator here at Friends of Nevada Wilderness. Um, and I use she, her pronouns, and I will be hosting tonight. Um, but before we fully get started, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that here in Southern Nevada, we're on the unceded ancestral lands of the Southern Paiutes or Nuwuvi people, um, where our speaker David resides is the unceded ancestral lands of the Cayus, Umatia, and Walla Walla tribes. Um, what is now called Nevada is home to 27 federally recognized and countless more non-federally recognized tribes um, of indigenous peoples. Uh, these people are the stewards of the land and continue to care for our precious natural places to this day. I would like to invite you to take a moment to consider the, legacies, the many legacies of colonization and how they have brought you here today. So for those of you who might be new to our speaker series, uh, Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a statewide nonprofit focused on protecting wild lands. Uh, wilderness areas are natural landscapes that are largely unaffected by people. Um, and we protect these lands in a few main ways. Uh, we advocate by speaking up for these lands to get them permanently protected and manage to maintain the wildness. We educate by sharing the values and vision of wilderness at community events, presentations just like this one, and finding the common ground to protect our wildland heritage. And we steward uh, because these lands cannot protect themselves. We work with volunteers on the ground to help monitor, restore, and improve access to these special places. Um, we hold this wild speaker series every first Thursday of the month by hosting a local environmental expert for people who are interested in learning more about the outdoors and ways to get involved with conservation efforts. Uh, so I would like to introduce you to our speaker, uh, David Lucas. Um, this is our third um, uh, talk in a series of four talks with David Lucas. Uh, he is a speaker, writer, and a naturalist who has led thousands of walks, talks, classes, workshops, and tours, including more than 10 years working as a prolific hiking, hiking guide and educator in Yosemite National Park. Um, he will be our speaker uh, for um until next month april yeah and um it, it, this is part of a special four-part series about bird biology and birding in the sierra nevadas um and then last but not least a couple of housekeeping notes before we jump in um please keep yourself on mute if you're not speaking if we can if we begin to have any bandwidth issues i'll turn it off everyone's cameras so our speaker can come through clearly and then um, please feel free to drop your questions or any thoughts that you have in the chat, and then we will address them at the end. And with that, I will hand it off to David. Hi there, thank you so much. Um, pleasure to be back again, and thank you for that wonderful introduction. It's such an honor to be speaking for a group that's doing so much great work like this in an area that I love so much and you all love so much. So I'm glad we can all come together in an evening of conversation and learning about some more things. Um, so I don't have to say anything about myself because you already did such a good job introducing me. Uh, let me go ahead and just call up my program here and I'll use this as a way to start. So does that work, Clarice? Yes, I can see it completely and fully. I, the only thing is I can't see myself which is what we talked about, <laughs> but that's okay. Anyway, um, so as long as everyone can see this, that's all that matters to me. Uh, and I am a naturalist. Uh, I spent my life hiking every day, taking notes about the natural world, coming up with questions, coming back home in my library, huge library, um, and just researching everything, looking things up, and then turning that into stories. I uh, make videos, I write articles, I write books. My most recent project is a newsletter on my website. So if you go to my website, you can also scan the QR code on your phone, go right to it uh, and sign up for the newsletter that comes out every week. I try to cover a diversity of uh, interesting nature topics. So last week was about whiskers. This week was about Lewis and Clark and the language of Lewis and Clark. Every week is completely different. And with that, we'll go into tonight's talk. <clears throat> about colors in birds. So this is the third 
in a series of talks about different aspects of bird biology. Really cool to kind of just spend some time and kind of sink into different aspects of the bird world. We looked at bones, um, and tonight we're going to look at colors. And I think this is a great topic for tonight because it's the beginning of the breeding season. It's when we're most likely to start noticing birds uh, and paying attention to them in their fullest splendor of their color, their brightest colors of the year. And before we start, I wanted to say right off the bat that this is an educational presentation. And I'm using a variety of images that I get off the internet uh, to illustrate the points we're covering, but I did not take any of these photos we'll be using tonight. So if you think, wow, he's a great photographer. No, this is kudos to the amazing photographers who um, post all these photos. And um, I, I just really enjoy having this chance to talk about bird colors. It's a fascinating topic. And then if you really enjoy this topic and want to learn more about bird colors, there's this book, this National Geographic book, which is a fantastic resource for you. Um, there's a lot more technical books out there about this topic, but this book has a lot of amazing illustrations. It's easy to read, and it's the single best introductory text on the subject, and it's the main book that I use in the work that I do, so I would recommend it. And I think we can all agree when we look at the variety of some examples of bird colors that bird colors are one of the reasons why we really connect the birds. Um, and, and not only are these colors amazing in these birds, but we always seem to be seeing something new because every time we look at the birds in uh, on our walks and in our backyard, it seems like we're seeing something different because there's so many variations on even the birds that are familiar to us. And there are actually so many beautiful birds in the world that we could just spend this entire hour just showing photographs of birds like this and just be amazed. Um, but let's start exploring this question of why there are so many colorful birds and how birds use color. So if you were here for my previous talk on bird bones and skeletons, you might remember that we talked about how basically all the birds in the world, the vast majority of birds in the world, all look about the same out of the 10,000 species of birds in the world. The vast majority of them are kind of I can't see myself, but somewhere in here in this range of smaller than a football with this streamlined shape, all due to the constraints of flight. They all have to be about the same size and the same shape. So birds need a way to tell themselves apart. And um, color is an amazing way to tell yourselves apart. It's elegant, it's lightweight, and it does not interfere with flight. So it's a perfect solution. You just paint colors on your feathers. Feathers are like blank tapestries waited, waiting to be painted with different colors. And then you can take on almost an infinite variety of colors, and then you mold these feathers regularly so you can send different, different signals at different times of year for different purposes. So it's actually really an awesome solution that doesn't interfere with their flight. And I want to compare this to mammals, so I just grabbed some random mammals. And what's the first thing you notice about all these mammals here compared to the birds we were just looking at? Well, mammals are always some shade of brown or gray. So why is this? Well, mammals are almost exclusively living on the ground and they need to be hidden to either avoid being eaten or to sneak up on food. Uh, so the majority of mammals are kind of some shade of brown or gray with maybe some reddish tints in them. And because they all are mostly hidden, they use their sense of smell to communicate. They have really good senses of smell. They use a highly nuanced world of odors to communicate with each other. But birds don't have a sense of smell. And birds have the ability to fly away in response to a predator so they can escape. This frees them up to communicate with each other with bright colors instead. And so I think that's one reason why birds have so many bright colors. And here's a fun thing to consider. I, I really enjoy this. I put it in here. Think about the fact that our eyes are the only part of the human body that where we actually have bright colors. And then think about how much we respond to each other's eyes and we fall into each other's eyes and just gaze at them. And I think this has something to do with eyes being a focal point of color. And we are instinctively drawn to color because of this. It's our way of communicating. And I think it's probably a reason why we're so drawn to the colors in birds, because our eyes just go right into the color. We fall into that world really readily. 
So birds separate themselves and they communicate with each other by having different unique colors and not only different unique colors, but unique color patterns that they use to tell each other apart. So for example, we'll look at some examples of males and females. About half of the birds in the world tell each other apart by their colors. The males and the females look different. And in some birds, there's not a single feather that they share in common, like the red-winged blackbirds here. That male in the front, the female in the back, do not share a single feather in common. They're completely different. This makes it instantly easy to tell apart a male and a female at a glance. But you have examples like these northern flickers, where the males and the females look identical, except for one subtle mark, like the red mustache on the male in the front, and the female in the back has the gray face. And if you add a red mustache, paint a little red mustache on this female, the male instantly thinks that his mate is a rival male and will try to chase her away. So they're relying on that very simple mark, but otherwise they look the same. And you can have species where the female is just a more subdued version of what the male has on as plumage. So it's just a little bit paler overall, a little bit muted. And you also have examples where it's flipped. This is pretty rare, but like in the Wilson's foul ropes here, the female in the back is the one that's flamboyantly colored and the male is a muted version of the female because in this species, the females do all the courtship, all the territories, they fight over the males and the male's job is to raise the babies and, and take care of the eggs. So it's a unique mating system. But there's another strategy that's used by about half of the birds in the world where the males and the females look the same and they're identically colored. And this is what's called being sexually monochromatic. And so when you think about monochromatic, you think of boring. But as these scarlet macaws attest, um, being monochromatic just means that they're the same color and it doesn't necessarily mean that they're boring. We're going to return to the idea of males and females looking the same later, but this just illustrates the point. And as I mentioned earlier, because birds molt on a regular basis, it's easy then to use your colors to signal seasonal differences. And for example, we have in this ruddy deck a real clear difference between the summer breeding plumage and the winter plumage in the male. This is not a male and a female, this is a male in two different seasons. And this is especially important because males and a lot of birds are forced to wear these gaudy colors like this in the breeding season as a way to signal aggression, to signal their willingness to be competitive, their sexual attractiveness. But you know, for the rest of the year, it would be a drag to carry around all these bright colors when you're trying to gather in flocks and not fight, but actually cooperate and sit together all winter and save your energy. The other drawback of being this colorful is that you attract predators. And that might be worth it when you're going to breed um, because you their sole purpose during the breeding season is to attract a mate. And if you get eaten, well, at least you died trying. But you don't want to do that all winter long. That's a tremendous disadvantage. So you want to molt into something that's more subdued at that time of year. Colors can also be a very useful signal of how old you are. So young birds leave the nest wearing these temporary juvenile feathers, this juvenile western gull on the left, the adult on the right. And then with these juvenile feathers, they actually may molt into several different subadult plumages over the course of one year or more years. Some birds takes four years some even more, to go through a sequence of subadult molts that signal that they're not an adult, but they're not a juvenile. And so why would young birds want to have a distinct color pattern like this? Well, these unique color patterns are important because it helps prevent them from being attacked by aggressive territorial birds. It signals to other birds that the bird is young. Like, I'm inexperienced, don't attack me because it's not gonna do you any good. And it benefits both the young birds because they don't wanna get attacked, they can't afford to get attacked. And it benefits, say, if this is a dominant adult, it does not wanna spend 
all of its energy chasing around other birds that are just young birds that pose no real threat. So it immediately signals a visual relationship between the two. Don't attack me. It's not worth it. And I'm going to save energy by not attacking you. So that's another way that you can use colors. So colors can be used in a lot of different ways, and we'll talk about more ways, but I always want to introduce those ideas first and then come into like, well, what is color? And color is light. It's part of an energy spectrum. But keep in mind that when we say that something is a certain color, we are talking about reflected light. Because if we turn off all the lights and it's dark, there's no color at all. Color is reflected light coming back to our eyes. There is no color out there independently in the world. If I picked up a, a pencil, a yellow pencil, if I picked up a yellow pencil, that is not yellow. The color is here. You're seeing light coming from here, reflecting off of this, entering your eyeball. And you're reading that in your brain as the color yellow. It doesn't exist here. It's a relationship of energy, part of this spectrum of energy, as the light moves from here to here. And keep in mind that when we're talking about color, we are talking about one tiny subset of a really big energy spectrum. It goes all the way from high intensity gamma rays to much wider spaced radio waves. And you can see this tiny little sliver here is what we see as color. This is part of an electromagnetic spectrum. There's nothing magical about this little band right here. It's just an arbitrary band that our eyes and our brain are attuned to interpret as color. It's just part of a much bigger energy spectrum. And because it's energy, it's moving in waves. And these waves enter our eye. So we have the waves of energy. They enter our eye and they're read by a series of rods and cones in the back of our eyeball. And they interpret these pulses of electromagnetic energy and send that signal to the brain. And then the brain reads those as color. This is actually a very complex task. Our brains have to be trained to do this. If a person who is blind gains their vision, they do not see color. They have to learn how to see color. And it's probably true for babies. It's hard to interview a baby and ask them what they're seeing. But babies also have to take this wall of information and break it into segments that's color. So human eyes have about have millions of these uh, cone cells that read three parts of the energy spectrum. And we see three colors. We have green ones, red ones, and blue ones all in a grid in the back of your eyeball. Each one of those three cones reads a different part of the energy spectrum, picks up a different signal and sends a different signal to the brain. It's all put together and interpreted as color. But birds are different because they have a fourth kind of cone and they read ultraviolet light. So they see four colors. They see red, green, blue, and ultraviolet. Now remember that color is just a made up name or part of this energy spectrum. And it makes no sense at all to ask what color ultraviolet is because it's just part of an energy spectrum, but it's part of it that we don't see. Birds also have something different. They have little oil droplets on the top of the, um, their cones and the oil droplets uh, filter out the light that's coming through it. It's like a little lens. It filters out the light. So only a small, part of the light signal goes into the cone, which means that they're seeing more precise parts of the energy spectrum, a more refined sense of color. And so where we might just see a green leaf in the world, they might be seeing many kinds of green. They're so much more precise in the levels that they're seeing. Um, so not only is ultraviolet light a fourth color, but it overlaps and interacts with the other colors. So look at how dramatically for us with our three colors, red, green, and blue, when those colors overlap, look what it does. It creates more parts of the color spectrum. If you take green and red together and get yellow out of it, that doesn't make sense, but there's another color there. Now imagine adding a fourth circle that's overlapping with everything and it's creating a whole nother range of combinations of colors that we can't even fathom what's going on. 
So for instance, this yellow-breasted chat looks yellow to us, but to another bird, both the yellow and ultraviolet cones are being activated at the same time, and it's creating a combination of colors that are overlapping, doing something that we can't even register what's going on here. And ultimately, we can't visualize how birds are seeing the world because there's no parallel for us seeing ultraviolet colors. Interestingly, though, some people can actually perceive UV light, ultraviolet light. But the problem is, is that our human brains don't know how to read it, so it doesn't register as a color. And then on another side note, there's a fascinating reason why birds see more colors than mammals. So we are a mammal. Mammals evolved very early on, 220 million years ago, I think it was, during the time of dinosaurs. And the first mammals were small, furtive creatures that came out at night to avoid dinosaurs. And because for millions of years they were out at night, they didn't need to see color. So they lost their cone cells. They lost some of their cone cells. And to this day, virtually all mammals see two colors, but one subgroup of mammals came out in the daytime, went up in trees and started eating fruit, the primates. And so now today, most mammals see two colors, primates, including humans, see three colors and birds see four colors. That's an explanation for it. <clears throat> so when we look at birds like a song sparrow, where males and females look the same to us, Keep in mind that those are visible colors that look the same. That's not the same as what birds are seeing. So therefore, it might not come as a surprise to you that when researchers look at this, that in over 90% of the bird species they've studied where the males and the females look exactly the same to us, they look different in the UV spectrum. They're showing different colors and different patterns. So it means that what looks the same to us is gonna look completely different to birds. And we always have to keep that in mind. So how are colors created in birds? So colors in birds are created in two ways. Colors can be created either by pigments or by the structures of the feather themselves. And there's some significant differences between these two strategies. So pigments are materials that are found inside of the feathers that absorb some wavelengths of light and reflect other wavelengths of light back to our eyes. And the wavelengths that are reflected back to our eyes is what we perceive as the color of that pigment. If you crush up a feather that has pigments in it, those pigments are still there, so the color is still there. But if you crush up a feather where the color is created by the structure of the feather, the color is lost because the structure is no longer intact. So two different ways of creating colors. The most common pigment that creates colors in birds is melanin. And it's the same pigment that colors our skin and our hair. Um, and melanins produce a wide range of blacks and browns and grays and golden hues, uh, kind of like you see in this rough grouse. These are all melanins doing different parts of the pattern. And they are manufactured from amino acids found inside of the bird's body. And then if there's no melanin in a feather, it's going to be white. So you have the white feather. So presence of melanin creates these colors. Absence creates white. Um, and all of the feathers on this bird right here are created by melanin. And one fascinating aspect of melanin coloration is that it's frequently arranged in very precise patterns. It gives you the bibs. It gives you the masks. It gives you the bars, the spots, and stripes. This is an extreme example of a very precise pattern, which is emblematic of melanin pigments. And when we talk about melanin, there are actually two types of melanin making colors in birds. We have eumelanin, which is responsible for kind of the blacks and the grays. So that's eumelanin. And then you have pheomelanin, which produces a range of golds and auburns, rust colors, maybe like this breast, but if you mix the two, you get browns, you get a range of browns. So I don't know whether this would be considered a brown or a rusty auburn color, but it's a combination of eumelanin and pheomelanin. Good luck saying those. Um, the second most common type of pigment in bird feathers is carotenoids. And there are over a dozen different kinds of carotenoids. 
and they produce the reds, the oranges, and the yellows in the bird world with different hues created by the mix of each of those dozen or so types of carotenoids. And then the saturation in the color is caused by the density of that pigment. So unlike melanins that are produced from amino acids inside the body, carotenoids are only produced by plants and they are never produced by animals. So what this means is that carotenoids can only be obtained in a bird's diet. And then from what they eat, it's transported to their feathers. Another characteristic of these carotenoid pigments is that they're never arranged in patterns. A feather is either colored with carotenoids or it is not. And this process of eating and then transporting carotenoid molecules takes energy. So it ends up being an excellent indicator of a bird's diet and its overall health. And it means that reds, oranges, and yellows can be paler or washed out in a low status or an unhealthy bird. And so what's going on here is that carotenoids are powerful antioxidants. Uh, anyone who's a, who goes aware of diet is aware of that. Carotenoids are really powerful antioxidants. And when a bird is unhealthy or sick, it has to make a choice. So it has a limited supply of carotenoids. Is it gonna divert those to its feathers and make beautiful feathers to attract a mate? Or is it gonna divert carotenoids to its immune system and try to get healthy? Well, it turns out that what they do is they choose their health over their breeding status and they try to get healthy so they can come back and breed another day. And at the same time, a bird that's brightly colored like this is a bird that has the best territory. And by definition, the best territory is the one with the best foods and they have the best foods in their diet, which means they have the richest colors and it shows up in their the richness of their carotenoids. So we have pigment colors that are created by pigments inside of feathers, but then we have structural colors that are created by the interplay of light on microscopic structures of the feather itself. And they don't exist inside the feather. Again, if you take that feather and break it down, you break up the structure, there's no more color. So these colors are formed as the light shines on the surface of the feather. And what happens is that the structure of the feather reflects back some parts of the spectrum. In the case of structural colors, it's going to be blue or purple. And then it's going to absorb all the other components of the spectrum. The reds, the oranges, yellows, and greens are getting absorbed, and they just stay inside the feather. Only the blue gets reflected, and that's what we see as blue. There's no blue pigment in the bird kingdom. It's reflected light by structures. And in many cases, the microstructures of the feathers are designed to amplify the color, like this scrub jay, to make it even shinier and even brighter. It takes the color and amplifies it. And when we talk about structural colors, there's actually two kinds of structural colors. There are ones that are non-iridescent like this. And then there are ones that are iridescent that change the color as you move your angle and look at it from different angles. So the blues and the violets are non-iridescent structural colors. And then if you take yellow carotenoids and put them over that or underneath that structure and combine the two, you get blue and yellow making greens which is something that happens in female warblers and vireos, birds like this. A lot of these greenish birds are mixing yellow carotenoid with blue structural color to create a mix that's greenish. The other type of structural color in birds is iridescent colors. And explaining them is a lot more complicated. Uh, so we'll just kind of touch this a little bit here. But the easiest way to visualize iridescent colors is to think about oil on a mud puddle and the way that the colors shift as the water moves and as you move your angle, the color is constantly changing. That's an iridescent color. So basically iridescent colors are created when the surface of the object reflects light back with these wavelengths hitting the surface, bouncing back to your eye, but other wavelengths go through the surface just a fraction of a tiny fraction of a, not even an inch, tiny fraction of a millimeter, just barely go in and then bounce off a, a lower layer. So you have the same wavelengths bouncing back at two different um, well, distances or times. They're slightly staggered. And when these, uh, the wave patterns interfere with each other, 
because they're staggered and are offset a tiny bit. So where they, let's see, so if one's going up, one wave pattern's going up and the other one's going down, they cancel each other out. That color gets canceled out at that angle. If another one's going up and the other one's going up, they amplify each other and you see a different color. So as you move your eye around or as the bird turns, the color is going to be slightly shifting. That's an iridescent color. Um, and this diagram is showing the structure of the feather and kind of how this is happening. So in a feather, there's an outer shell of keratin, the same stuff that's in your fingernail, but it's a thousand times thinner than a human hair, just a thin outer sheet. Underneath that is a spongy layer of keratin. And then you have these black layers of melanin underneath it. It could be one layer of melanin, or in this example, two layers of melanin or several stacked layers of melanin that are bouncing light back at different wavelengths. And um, you could think of it like if you take a piece of clear plastic, put it on top of a sponge and then put some black fabric underneath. That's kind of what's happening in a feather, clear layer outside, the light comes in, goes through the sponge, hits the black and bounces back or gets absorbed. Kind of what's happening here. And the precise arrangement of melanin and pigments results in uh, different kinds of uh, structural colors. So for example, these birds are both black. This is both caused by melanin, but the arrangement of the melanin creates this different look. So in the case of a red-winged blackbird, the melanin pigments are mixed throughout the carotene and it creates this matte velvety look like this. In the case of this grackle, the melanin is concentrated as a single layer at the base, and that's what's creating this iridescent color here that looks blue, purple, green, depending on the angle that you're looking at. So how do birds use colors? Oh, I'm going to go faster here. I hope this is okay. <laughs> I'm having so much fun. I'm talking more than I plan to. I might have to cut this short. So how do birds use all these colors? Well, um, birds use colors for a wide variety of social signaling, and this includes telling other birds about your health, your genetic makeup, your attractiveness, or your fitness. But at the same time, colors and the patterns of colors can be useful for other reasons besides signaling. So for example, colors interact with the bird's environment. So did you know that feathers are constantly being broken down by the environment? Um, if you've ever found a ratty looking bleached out feather laying in the sand or on the beach, you might've wondered why it's in such bad shape. Well, feathers actually break down pretty easily. And not only are feathers being broken down by sunlight, but also by abrasion against wind and dust particles as the bird is flying. So this doesn't matter so much if you're just sitting on a branch and making short flights from branch to branch all day. But if you spend your entire day soaring in the air with your wings fully stretched out, being hit by the sun, being abraded by dust and wind, you want to protect them. And the way they do that is they put melanin pigments in the tips of those feathers. This is the most important part of the wing. And so the feathers are protected with melanin, which strengthens the, the tips of the feathers and helps those birds last longer for the long flight. So almost all of these soaring birds have black wingtips. And in the same way that these melanin pigments will protect and strengthen feathers, they also act as a defense against bacteria that eat feathers. So bacteria love to eat feathers, but melanin pigments make it very hard for bacteria to eat and digest feather tissue. So bacteria, because it's hard to eat all this melanin here, they target the white spots. Now remember that white has no melanin in it. And so this leads to something called honest advertising. And what this means is that a bird can fake its social status by having a sweet song or by developing a fancy courtship display. But if a bird has white spots like this, the only way to keep those clean is to have enough extra energy to vigorously groom yourself and take oils from your uropygial gland on your tail and wipe it on your feathers to knock back the bacteria constantly. You have to be healthy and you have to have a lot of extra energy to do that and you cannot fake this. And colors also help regulate body temperatures in the environment, but surprisingly, black feathers are actually better in hot environments. The feathers aren't actually laying against the skin, they're lifted off. And so black feathers absorb the sunlight and the heat and then radiate it back out. So they're actually help keep the bird cool. And then in extreme cold environments, white feathers let the sunlight through and reach the feathers. So it's kind of counterintuitive. 
Um, colors also help a bird interact with this environment by helping the bird hide. And this is useful whether you're trying to avoid being eaten or you're hiding to catch food. And we're all familiar with the challenge of finding a owl sitting on a branch, or in this case, an American bitter and sitting in the reeds. Um, and you can also use color to hide in plain sight. And this is done with bold colors that break up your pattern. So a predator's eye is gonna look at this bird and be drawn right to this bold pattern and not see the outline of the bird and completely miss the fact that it's there standing right in front of them. So while many birds want to remain hidden, there are other birds that wanna be conspicuous by choice. And this is true for social birds that use these conspicuous colors to find each other. And it's usually often because uh, it's easier for them to find food in a group. It's more efficient than hunting alone. And social birds that are uh, highly social birds can be conspicuously white like these egrets, or they can be conspicuously black like crows and ravens. And then let's see, so 45 minutes. Uh, so Clarice, tell me, am I doing okay for time or? Do we have a specific timeline here I want to try to shoot for? Sorry. Yeah, um, I would like to leave about 10 minutes at the end for okay. questions. So we've got about 15 minutes. So I should go for about five. We're going for one hour total? Yes. Okay, so I'll go for five more minutes then. Okay, so let's uh, think about the idea of color as identity for birds. So I think the best reason to have unique colors and unique patterns of color is that it's a fantastic way to say to the other birds, hey, here I am. This is me. And you might want to say that to your parent or to your chick, to your partner or to your neighbor. But in all these cases, it's important to say who you are as an individual. So think about how easily we recognize each other by our faces. Well, birds can certainly do this and probably do it even better because it's really important for birds. So, for example, imagine you're trying to find your mate in a colony. Don't you think it important that you recognize their face in this, their unique face? If you land next to the wrong bird, they're going to start pecking you really hard. So you know you need to have a good way to identify yourselves. Um, and at all costs, you want to avoid fighting. Um, and especially you want to avoid fighting a superior rival. So one critical function of color is to serve as an honest signal of your fighting ability. You want to say, hey, I'm a weak bird. Don't waste your energy attacking me. Or you want to say, hey, I'm a superior bird. I'm going to kick your butt. So don't challenge me. So they use colors to signal that in an honest way because they all benefit when they're just honest about their status. Because um, if you're showing off and you're not ready for it, you're just going to get attacked by other dominant males and it does not help you. So we see that in red winged blackbirds. That red patch on their shoulder is a highly aggressive display. You know, you think about when you wave a red cape in front of a bull, how they attack the red cape. Same thing with the red. It's a sign of aggression in the animal kingdom. And so these red-winged blackbirds are up there in their branches. They're showing off. They're showing off their red patches. It's really aggressive. And then that same male, if he sneaks into another male's territory, he'll hide those patches. They can cover them up with their other feathers. And he'll sneak around hiding his patches. And then if he doesn't get challenged, he'll start to show a little bit of red. And then if he doesn't get challenged, he'll show more red. And then pretty soon he's confident again and showing all of his red. So, uh, and you may not realize it, but they actually have this red all winter long, but they keep it hidden in the winter so they don't spend all their time fighting. Um, and then the most obvious use for color is to attract mates, right? So, but remember that, uh, you know, these colors that look like yellow to us look completely different to the birds. So they're seeing more information in this yellow than we see. And uh, and we look at a red bird like this, uh, even more conspicuous, these incredible colors. So one thing to keep in mind though is that when the colors are in feathers, that is fixed at the time of feather development. So it's a sign of the bird's health when the feathers were developed. That could be months earlier. And then the bare parts change colors within days. So these are a signal of how healthy the bird's been in the last couple of days or the last couple of weeks. These two signals together tell you a lot about the bird, how healthy it's been in the past, how healthy it's been recently. And so the females are paying attention to the brightness of the male's colors, but also in this case, to the black patches. And the amount of melanin you have to make a patch like this is tied to your hormone levels. So the higher your social status, 
the higher your hormone levels are going to be, and you're going to have a bigger black patch. And interestingly, the females in different populations respond to different cues. They might, in one population, like this red, and in another population, just a few miles away even, like the black and prefer that. So it's not one size fits all. And when we look at a bird like this, we are instantly drawn to the color and we think that the females are drawn to the color too. We make the mistake of thinking that color is the only thing that matters to these females. When in fact, the female is just using this as one criteria among many. She's paying attention to the courtship songs, to the display, to the quality of the territory, to the male's behavior. All of these things fit together to tell the female um, whether that's the mate for her. So, I just want to wrap up by returning to our first question, why is there so many colorful birds in the world? And I think that the cheeky answer to this question has got to be that birds are colorful because they can be. They're able to fly away quickly. This has freed them up from the constraint of needing to stay hidden all the time. And they've taken this freedom and taken this and just run with it and turn colors into an astonishing range of uses. You can use color to stay hidden, you can show off, you can protect yourself from your environment, you can make personal statements, you can find each other. And what's even better, I think, is that the birds are actually aware of their own colors and the messages that they're sending with those colors because they will intentionally turn in the light to amplify or mute colors at different times for different messages. They're aware of the message they're communicating. And I guess if you're this pretty, Heck, it helps if you know what you look like and you use it to your full advantage. So ultimately, having all these flamboyant colors don't improve your chances of avoiding predators or living longer, but they definitely help you with your chances of finding a mate. And in the end, I think that might be the greatest advantage of all. Okay, let's see. Thank you, everyone. Oh, how do I get this? I can't get out of my program. <laughs> I guess that's it. There we go. All right. Okay. Thank you. It's okay. so fascinating. Um, yeah, well, I hope that wasn't too long. <laughs> no, it's actually it was actually perfect perfect <laughs> amount of time. Um, so we have we have just enough time for questions. Okay. Ah, and we they have started to um to come in already. All right. Um, so we'll do our first question. Frank asks, as birds search for a mate since the unseen, so, or since the seen and unseen color is what they look for, how do they know that it is of the same species? Are they self-aware of what they look like? Great question. Thank you, Frank. Um, well, I think with the example of males or the birds turning to show their colors or mute the colors suggests that they're aware of that. But remember that they're using a variety of signals. So vocalizations and behavior would also be really important. Um, you know, you, the bird might be hidden in the leaves uh, and you're gonna start looking for it because you hear that bird singing or making a vocalization that's familiar to you. So it's a whole package of cues you're using. And if the bird's not seen, you're gonna use something else. And if the bird's hidden and you don't know it's there because it's not vocalizing, you can't see the colors, then what's the point? You're not going to attract the mate that way. You're not going to find, you know, a, companions to flock together with. You've got to show yourself somehow, whether it's color patterns or vocalizations. So they work together, though. Great question, though. I hope they answered that. Um, Joy asks, are you familiar with hermaphroditic or hermaphroditic cardinals? <laughs> Oh my gosh, I have never heard of that. I want to know more now. I'm going to write it down. That's a different cardinals. Okay, that's, I have never heard of that. Are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I know, it must be a story. There's like so many amazing nature stories that come out every day. I can't keep up with them, but that is great. Okay. Um, the next question from Sue is, are birds more colorful near the equator? Yes, they are. That is a fantastic question. It has to do with the uh, bacteria mostly. Uh, so when you're in uh, when you're in wetter environments, whether it's cold north, Pacific Northwest, or Alaska where it's raining all the time, or you're at the equator when it's raining a lot, you're going to have a lot more bacteria, right? 
So you need to protect yourself from the bacteria that's gonna be living in the human environment. If you're in the desert, bacteria can't do much in the dry heat. It needs moisture to, to hatch and be alive. So birds in moist areas have a lot more bacteria eating their feathers. They have to really uh, deal with that. So in Northern areas where it's cold, those birds tend to be darker, uh, darker grays, darker browns, darker blacks, um, because they're putting more melanin in their feathers to protect against the activity of all those bacteria. Well, if you go to the equator, it's even wetter and warmer, which means the bacteria is way more active, a lot more bacteria in those humid conditions. And at that point, it's you can't keep up. No matter how much melanin you put in your feathers, you can't keep up with the load of bacteria that's going to be hitting you on the equator. And so what's easier is carotenoid production in your feathers. That's easier. Um, and so birds on the equator do that because it's a low cost way of putting color in your feathers. And so they just uh, put, they make their beautiful, colorful feathers and bacteria eat them and they just molt them quickly and just keep creating more of them. But the birds in the north do it with melanin. So I think that's, that's a great answer to that. All right. Chisato says, thank you for this presentation. The visuals and the explanations were amazing. I don't remember the name of the de example ducks you showed um, early on, but could you speak on how those ducks or how birds in general change their color seasonally? Well, okay, so there's a ruddy duck, right? Uh, so they're changed, well, uh, well, they're molting their feathers, and with every molt, there's a new investment in the structure and the makeup of that feather, and so they're just changing the process that makes the feathers. So that's all they're doing is they're just molting out of one plumage and coming up with a new group of feathers that's been triggered to produce a different color. Uh, the bill is a little different, but remember that these are, mm, let's see how the bill work. Uh, someone was telling me that that ruddy duck bills actually have, I'm gonna write that down. I wanna look this up. Someone told me that ruddy duck bills are the only blue pigment in the bird world. And I find it hard to believe, but uh, how else would the bill turn color? I don't know the answer to that. That's a great question. Uh, so, but generally birds are changing colors with the seasons because they're molting with the change of at least once a year, if not twice a year with the seasons. And I see the link for the, I'm going to look up those uh, <laughs> cardinals. I, you know, there's a lot of strange things happening now. I wonder if, uh, oh my God, that's incredible. I'm reading this in the chat. Sorry. Um, I got to read this. This is so cool. I had no idea. Wow. Okay. Sorry. Totally distracted. Never, never remotely crossed my mind. So I'm fascinated. Okay. Um, John asks, you mentioned that white was not pigmented. Possible bacteria on those non-pigmented non area. Are those white areas, do those white areas molt easier than other feathers? No, the, the color of the feather is not going to help the feather molt. The molt, the feathers are coming out, they're like hairs in your skin. You know, you can't say that hair is going to fall out sooner than this hair. They're all made the same way and they all molt in a predetermined biological pattern. Um, and the bacteria is equally on all of your feathers, but they they can't digest where the melanin is very easily. The white is easy to digest. So imagine that you take, you know, yummy food and you put a bunch of sand in it, like make you make a soup. You throw a bunch of sand in it and there's all that grit in there and you're trying to eat it and you got to work your way through all that grit. It's just not pleasant. And I imagine it the same way with melanin pigments. It's just make a mouthful. It's hard for the bacteria to break it down they are going to preferentially try to eat the white feathers because there's no melon in, in it and it's easier to digest. You don't have to work your way through all of that fiber, say, or the grit. Um, so, and then those white areas molt the same as the red feathers generally, yeah. Um, Chisato just offered, I know blue fooded boobies have blue bills from their diet, which is sardines. I'll look that up. I'm taking notes. These are great, great questions and observations. Uh, 
Well, I find that hard to believe because I have always read that there is no blue pigment. There's no blue pigment in the bird kingdom. So you can't, I don't know how you would get that from your diet unless they're mixing it with some other color or something. I don't know, but I'll look that up too. Thank you. Um, any other final questions? The chat has slowed down a bit. Mm -hmm. That's great. Those are fantastic questions. Oh. Ah, yes. Um, I think I can probably put it, pop the chat. Sure. I'll, I'll pop your website in the chat. Um, and then Paul asks, don't flamingos get their color from food? Because they eat the, the, I think, the shrimp. Yeah, they are. They do. Um, and uh, yeah, they're getting it from what, the, what is that? It's a unique thing that they're doing. Uh, they're, they're you're getting it from their food, I think. And uh, in my slideshow, I had an example of a bird. I hope I can still show this in my, I just do screen share. Yeah, let's just do screen share. Can we still do that? Do you see this, if I do this? Oh uh, yeah, we can, yeah, we can totally oh, see We're it. seeing the whole thing, but anyway. Uh, these uh, Egyptian vultures uh, have this incredible orange face. You can see that, right? Um, and so this has always been a mystery because so now based on what we know, where does that intense orange come from? And it comes from carotenoids, right? But vultures are eating dead animals. So it's always been a mystery. Where is the carotenoids coming from in these vultures diet? Well, they finally figured out that not only are they eating the dead animals, but they're ripping apart the intestines and eating the feces to get the carotenoids they need to make their faces orange. So kind of not exactly like flamingos, but <laughs> similar idea. I just think that's so cool. It's a neat, it's a neat uh, I agree. Well, all right then. I popped um, David's website in the chat. I didn't put www dot in front of it, so it didn't hyperlink, but um, you get the gist. <laughs> um, but I want to thank everybody so much for uh, for joining us tonight. Just a quick reminder that Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a membership-based organization. Over 80% of the donations we receive go directly to advocating for wilderness protection, restoring habitat for wildlife, and maintaining hiking trails. We'd love for you to become a member and join us in keeping Nevada wild and beautiful. And then um, next month will be, let me check the calendar, May 4th will be the final talk in this really incredible bird series. And I believe we'll be talking, uh, the theme is it all begins in the nest. Um, so be sure to look out for, um, the link and everything for May 4th and we will see everybody next time. Thanks so much. Bye. Have a Thank good one, everyone. You.